so much for singing. Thank you. Wonderful singing. Wonderful singing. Hope you know the altars are never closed around here. They're always open. Amen. I think his is as well, praise God. That's never been closed to me. I've always been able to go to the Lord and pour my heart out to him. And pour my heart out to him. He cares, amen. Nobody cares like Jesus does. Jesus cares. If you take your Bibles, please, if you will, and go to the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk. And we will look at the third chapter, third chapter of the book of Habakkuk, and see what thus saith the Lord, amen. And uh, we'll look at just, I guess, two verses and see what these two verses have in store for us. We will finish Habakkuk one of these days, amen. We will finish Habakkuk. Uh, it has been a wonderful study thus far. I know we took a brief break uh, and looked in Matthew and a couple different places there in Matthew, a couple messages there in Matthew chapter 5 on being uh, salty and shining for the Lord. And then now we've made our way back here in Habakkuk. And I, I will promise that we'll finish in the month of December because we may use a few Wednesday nights and look some at the birth of Christ. Of course, we'll be looking at that some throughout the month as well on Sundays. So it's just I absolutely love this time of year. I mention that just about every service during this time of year because of the spirit that comes with it. Amen. The spirit of Christ and what it means to me and how God in heaven uh, helps me during this time of year. And I thank him so much for that. Now, I know it's not just this time of year. It ought to be we get help all the year long. And, but when it comes to this time of year, it just it, it is something about it. I just so enjoy it. And let me go ahead and say this. I don't have them up here with me. But in the back back there next to Brother Jerry Price, up underneath the little table, there's two boxes of gospel tracks there. And uh, there's one that says Jesus is the reason and uh, or the reason for the season. And the other one says the perfect gift, I believe it is. Wonderful tracks. We were passing them out last year. And I went ahead and brought them out. It's December 1st, amen. So you can start handing those gospel tracks out. The one is a trifold. It opens up three times. Much information in it, but man, it sure is beautiful on the inside. I love the greens and the reds and the different things that's involved in that gospel track. If you'll take time to open that and read it and familiarize yourself with it. That way when you give it to someone and as you're going through it with them, they will, you will be able just to walk right along with them and they'll know that you know what it says on the inside. Say, well, let me see that. Let me see what it says type deal. And you've given it to them already. And so I challenge you to take them, read them, get familiar with them, and give them out, amen. Don't just leave them in your pocket. Give them to someone. That way someone can read the message of the Word of God that's on the inside of those gospel tracts. One man said they'll track you, amen. Wherever you go, they'll go with you. And so if you'll give them out, you'll watch the Lord work. You, you may not get to see it right in front of you. you. may go home with somebody and God working it there. But at the same time, God is working, amen. And I thank the Lord for that. So I would challenge you to get some of them on your way out the door tonight and start passing them out. I'd like to get those two boxes out during the month of December. Shouldn't be hard. I'd like to get them all out and get them in the hands of our people around us here in our community. Habakkuk chapter number 3. I invite you to stand in honor of the rivers, the reading of the Word of God. In Habakkuk chapter number 3, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. And we're simply going to read two verses, I believe. So um, some people may think, man, it's going to be short tonight. Well, I'm, I'm six foot two, so I'm as short as I'm going to be, I guess. But we'll see what the Bible does. In verse number one of Habakkuk chapter number three, the Bible says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shiganoth, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. And was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. 
in the midst of the years make known. Notice this. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Let us pray. Father, thank Thee once again for the Word of God. Thank Thee for all of the souls that have come out tonight. Those listening by way of live stream, I pray, God, that You'd touch. Lord, that You'd help them. Father, that You would bless. Lord, I need You tonight. I'm not looking for someone else. I'm looking for You. And Father, as we've already read here in Habakkuk chapter 3, we stand in a dire need in our day and age. If Habakkuk stood in need of it in his day, how much more so in ours? Father, I beg thee to forgive me from why I've failed you since the last time we spoke. Let me preach now in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit of God, leaning solely upon thee, the arm of flesh will fail me, but you've never failed me. And I thank you and I praise you for all that you do. For it is in the Lord Jesus Christ's name which we do pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Thank you for standing with us this evening. As we pick back up here where we left off in the book of Habakkuk, we have seen many things that have went back and forth. I, not necessarily back and forth, but... We've seen what God has said, or to begin with, all the way back in chapter 1, we've seen what Habakkuk had said, and what Habakkuk had come to the Lord with, and how Habakkuk, for lack of better words, was fed up with the way things were going with Israel. He'd seen the way it had went, he'd seen the way of the people, and now he's asking the ways of God, and how God has allowed these things to happen with no judgments or with no repercussions or we could say consequences to their actions, which we all know that there's consequences that come from everything that goes on in our lives and that God may stay his hand for a little while, but it will come to pass when we speak of his judgment. And so Habakkuk's crying to the Lord, asking the Lord, what's going on? How long, O oh Lord? And then the Lord calls back out to Habakkuk, responds with his answer, and Habakkuk gets upset. And then Habakkuk's response is, how in the world can you take a nation that's, I don't know how to say it, more evil, amen, than we are and judge us that is more righteous than they are? And so then the Lord comes back with what's going to happen with them. And we see that going back and forth between chapters 1 and 2. In chapter 2 you read of how the Lord gives the reasoning behind the Babylonians coming down. The Lord gives the what's going to happen to the Babylonians because of what they did unto his people. Now I'll say this, and it's sometimes it's difficult to reconcile or put all of it together. God used the Babylonians to judge his people, Israel, because of how Israel was. And when God used them to judge Israel because of the way they'd done, God judged them for their actions. Read it in your Bible, amen. You'll see that. The Babylonians, or I should say Nebuchadnezzar, I'm coming through Ezekiel right now and have been working my way through the uh, 30 in 30 to 37 or right in that area and I've read how Egypt was taken away and how Nebuchadnezzar went to Egypt when Egypt thought nobody will ever come in for me Nebuchadnezzar comes in takes Egypt scatters Egypt Nebuchadnezzar brings the sword in devours conquers and takes Israel well Ezekiel had all that in his prophetic book and what the Bible says in Ezekiel. Habakkuk sees it already here. God lets Habakkuk see it. God shows Habakkuk what's going to take place. God lets Habakkuk know what's going to befall the Babylonians because how they caused others to sin. So let me say this. We best think about things before we cause someone else to sin. 
before we cause someone else to stumble, before we cause someone else to fall, because there will be consequences on our behalf even in those situations. I mean, I recall right now the Lord Jesus talking to them as he said for them not to cause one of these little ones to, stump, to stumble or fall, because if you offend one of these little ones, he said there will be a millstone about your neck and you'll be cast into the sea or into the water. And my friend, I don't know if you understand it or not, but a millstone is not a little bitty stone. It's one that is very large, and it was used to grind. I can't remember about how many pounds they said one weighed. I, now I don't want to just estimate or guess right here, but I know it was quite a bit. And I know you wouldn't be swimming for one to try to help your swimming strength, amen. You would be in the water and not coming up. You would be what I talked about Sunday morning, unsubmerged. Not immersed, but submerged, amen, and not coming back up. And so we see that with the, what the Lord says to how people cause others to falter and fail. So next time you think about something, be careful who you're taking with you and what you're doing. But then we come to this particular chapter in chapter number 3. I want to preach on this thought for a few moments on a heart cry, on a heart cry. You say, why would you want to preach that? Well, we see it in verses 1 and 2, but we also have seen it throughout the whole book. Go back to chapter 1 for a moment, because I'll point out a verse where it is still he is crying out after he and the Lord have talked about different things. Verse number 2 said, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, he says. And thou wilt not hear, even cry, he says. So we see that he's crying out to God. We see that he's pouring his heart out to the Lord. And I'll say this, praise God. When somebody gets to the place where they're going to cry out to God, where they're going to pour their heart out to the Lord, at that point his ears are attentive unto our cry. Most of the time, we just get to the place where we, what, as you would hear old timers say, mealy mouth around. Don't really have a whole lot to say and just kind of beating around. But when your heart is crying out and you're broken and the heart is, has nothing to do but to pour out to God, at that point, right or down, God's ear is attentive unto his children's cry. And you can uh, think about this, those of you that are parents, you know when your children are crying from a quote-unquote whining standpoint and maybe it, it's really nothing and at that point you're just not paying attention to them or when one actually is crying because something is really wrong and at that point you're attentive at that point you're ready to be parent on the scene at that point you want to try to come to their calls and come to the rescue or whatever it may be and so at this point Habakkuk is crying out unto God. His heart is crying out to the Lord. One man said this, there's three options. When I was coming through and reading through some different things in Habakkuk chapter 3, he said there's three options. Ruin, revival, or rapture. Those are the three options that we have, church. It's either ruin, which it looks to be the way that things are headed. It is revival, which needs to be where things are headed, or it is rapture, even so come, Lord Jesus. You're not going to hear me complain on that one, amen. I'm ready to see the Lord. But I sure would love to see a revival in this day and in this age. I sure do believe God can still revive his people. I still believe that revival could take place. If I didn't, I wouldn't preach it that I do. But I believe God can do a mighty work. Number one, I'd like to look at this as we think about a heart cry. We see the singing that is involved. The singing that's involved. You say, I don't see any singing in the text. But I'd like to point your attention just for a moment in verse number one. The Bible says a prayer 
You look that word prayer up because prayers are important when you read them in the Bible. You think of intercessory prayer when we uh, praise the Lord for that. We intercede on one another's behalf and there's different prayers that you find throughout the Bible. But this one, when you look up the word prayer, you'll find out that it is the word that would mean him. I'm not talking about him as in H-I-M, although our prayer goes to him, amen. But I'm talking about H-Y-M-N, like what we sing, amen, as we sing hymns when we stand and sing the songs of Zion. But then there's another little word that we're going to look at here in just a moment, and that is the last word of this verse, which is Shiganah. That is also seen in another place in our Bibles, and we'll go there in just a few moments, it's found in different areas, I guess, in different forms, but there's only two places that we find it in this form, and um, we'll go, we're going to look at the other one in just a moment. And what we find is we find Habakkuk at this point, it has come to a place where he has heard what God has said, where he's listened to God, and it has caused a response from Habakkuk's heart. Now, let me say this. I'm not trying to get ahead of myself, but I guess I'm going to. As we find in verse number two some things, that every time God speaks to us, every time and God's word is read, I can say that because I heard that earlier, God's word should be in red. I said every time we're here, we have God's word read, amen, from behind the pulpit, praise God. But when we think about God's word, as you read God's word, as God's word is preached, as God's word is taught, it causes you to respond. Bottom line, you're either going to respond in a receiving way or respond in a rejecting way. We're going to look at, once again, I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. It just seems that that's where I'm going right now. That's all right because you'll probably hear me repeat myself again. And the greatest way for someone to remember something and to memorize something is repetition, amen. It's been that way and it'll always be that way. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. But look with me, if you will, please, in Psalm chapter number 7. Psalm chapter number 7, I want to read something here for us to understand we know that the book of Psalms or as we come to Psalm 7 one of the Psalms we know these were meant to be sung these are hymns we call them and they're songs that are weaved in and out and I'd like for you if your Bible does in uh, chapter number 7 if it has a title or a heading to it you'll see that it says I don't know. I'm not going to try to pronounce it the way it is here. I've done my best in Habakkuk. You can pronounce it this way here however you want to at home. But it says of David, which he sang unto the Lord. These two places are the only two places you find this word in your Bible. It's interesting because here, notice what goes with it here which he sang unto the Lord, notice this, concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. I don't know if y'all remember him or not, but he's not a friend of David's. He's not somebody that's trying to help David along the way. He didn't say, David, I'll give you something to eat so that you can continue. But notice verse number 1 in Psalm 7. O Lord, my God. Now we're going to, in a few moments, transition this song back over to Habakkuk chapter 3 and just see how Habakkuk starts with his song. He says, O Lord, notice this, my God, in thee do I put my trust. Notice these words. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he Tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is none to deliver. Two things we'll point out here. One, David's between a rock and a hard place. He said, this man wants to kill me. He said, if he could, he would literally rend me in pieces like a lion. And so I wonder if you think about it for a moment, what was going on there in Daniel when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den? I wonder, would they have rent him in pieces had it not been for God? 
Yes. Okay. And so David here says, Lord, he wants me. He wants to devour me. He wants to kill me. He wants to rend me in pieces. But he says, oh, Lord, my God, deliver me. And so what does he pay? What does he sing? What is he doing? What does he say? He's saying, Lord, if you don't deliver, there is none else to deliver me. Go back to verse 2. You say, why do you think that way? The Bible says at the end of verse 2 of Psalm 7, while there is none to deliver. He says, God, if you don't deliver, he'll rend me in pieces as the lion would. He'll tear me apart. He'll destroy me. He said, if you don't deliver, there will be none to deliver. And can I say tonight that each and every one of us should understand that God is our deliverer. I'll put it to you like this. But the devil, we know him. He is as a roaring lion. He's walking about seeking what? Whom he may devour, the Bible says. And let me ask you something. Had it not been for when you were saved, had it not been for when you called upon, oh Lord my God, and trusted in Him to be your Savior, but hold on a minute, what does salvation mean? It means deliverance. And so here we find that Satan is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour a lion. He wanted to rend you in pieces. He wanted to destroy you. He wanted to kill you. But instead you called on the God of glory and you understand that it was He that delivered delivered. Why? Because there was none else that could deliver thee. No one else was going to be able to deliver you in your troubles and in your trials. And so in Psalm 7, let me ask you, is David's song, I don't mean this to sound weird, one of jubilation? No. David's song is one of desperation. David said, Lord, I need you to deliver. God, I need you. Without you doing this, there no way I'm going to make it. And so when we think of this word shiganoth, or we think of this word, however you want to say it in Psalm 7, go back over now unto Habakkuk chapter number 3. In Habakkuk chapter 3, the Bible says a prayer of Habakkuk, we're, we're noticing the singing that's involved, the prophet upon shiganoth. And as we think about he's upon something, it's according to different songs, or as it would be in the Hebrew, this word shiganoff would mean poem. It's also rendered poem as well. And so as he is putting this together, this word, it signifies a time of danger or a time of joy. One of two is what it signifies. And it is said that during David's singing of this song, it was a time of danger. It was a time of desperation. What is it in Habakkuk's? Now, we'd have to fast forward to the end. Go with me there, please. The Bible says in verse number 18, we're going to see if this is one of danger or joy. In Habakkuk chapter number 3, verse number 18, he says, Yet I will rejoice. Now, let's go back over to verse number 1. The Bible says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shiganoth, when we get here in the singing that's involved, David's using it in great danger. But Habakkuk is using it in the joy and praises. You say, how in the world is it that Habakkuk, in the midst of all the things that God has said, in the midst of everything that God said was going to go on with Israel, that God said would happen to Israel, that God said would take place in Israel, praise God, it's my praise time, amen. In the middle of all of that, how is it that Habakkuk can still have joy? How is it that Habakkuk can still sing praises? How is it that Habakkuk can still have a song in his heart there's only one way in the middle of all of it that anybody will ever have a song in their heart anybody will ever be able to sing praises anybody will ever be able to have joy when, the, when people think that everything should be going to pieces and that's because you know the God of glory and so for Habakkuk and I'm not 
saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying David didn't know God because David did, and David does, amen. But at this point, I've heard David sing the praises of God in a cave. We've heard David sing the praises of God on the side of a field, but here Habakkuk is singing the praises of God, even knowing that the Babylon's going to come in and take all the things away. And praise God, we're going to look again. I preached this here before, the latter part of this chapter, and we're going to preach it again when we get to it on rejoicing in the rubble, but Habakkuk has no problem being able to do that because he knows God. Amen. It's a hard thing sometimes when things just seem to be utterly falling to pieces, when things just seem to be crushed, when things seem to be down, to be able to sing, oh Lord my God, oh Lord God, and call on him and sing praises and joy unto him. But my friend, if you know the God of glory, you know that in the midst of all of it, he gives joy unto his children. Look with me in your Bibles. Not only we find the singing involved, we'll find the speech involved. I'll tell you just two verses tonight, amen. Verse number two. The Bible says, now do you remember how Psalm 7 in his song as it started was? He said, oh Lord. He said, my God, but he, said, he started it with, oh Lord. And he wasn't saying that in the wrong way. Notice the Bible says in verse number two, Oh Lord, it's, there seems to be something that is connecting these two songs. I can tell you what it is. It's the Lord. And both of them are understanding him as in the Jehovah God of Israel, the one that is, the one that was, the one that is to come, the one that's always been and always will be. They are looking unto him and seeing the notice we find under the speech involved, the recognition of the speaker. He says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. Now here's what I'd say. Oftentimes you find people get up and they preach, thus saith the Lord, and then you what they'll do is they'll say, you know what? I'm going out of here. I'm out of here. I heard what he said, but that preacher's crazy. I don't care if he preaches it that way. I'm not going to listen. Hold on a minute, because if it's thus saith the Lord, no matter who the preacher is, no matter what all goes on with it, if he's coming out of the Bible and it comes forth out of the Word of God, it's not the preacher, it's God. Amen. And the recognition here of the speaker is he says, Oh Lord, I have heard thy. He said, I've heard thy speech, oh Lord. Now back he didn't say, Well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar sent me a telegram. <laughs> Habakkuk, as a matter of fact, Nebuchadnezzar's not even in view yet here. He's on his way. The wheels are in motion. The wheels are turning. As I asked my daughter earlier when she come in and said, there's lights on the bus. I said, there's wheels on the bus. What do they do, amen? We know they go around. But I said that because we think here in the text, Babylon is, they're making their way. It may not, they may not have started yet, but right or down, it's as, it's as plain as a nose on my face. That's what's going to happen. Because God said it. And if God says it, amen. that settles it. That should be the way it is in his children. If God says it, that settles it. Amen. If God's word says it, that settles it. Notice this. When we think about the recognition of the speaker, Habakkuk says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech. But notice this. We find the receiving of the speech. He did not just say, O oh Lord, somebody said something to me. But he said, I have heard. Not only did he speak it, but he heard it. He's received what God has told him. He's brought it in. I said this earlier to you, and I said I was getting ahead of myself. I'm going to insert it right here again. Look what the Bible says immediately following, I've heard thy speech. It says, and was afraid. Do you see what it done? Habakkuk says, I've heard thy speech, O Lord. I received thy word. And because of the receiving of thy word, it has caused me to have a change go on. He said, I was afraid. Now, this fear that we think of here, we hear of the different fears in the Bible. There's a reverential fear. He said, I revered thee, 
O oh Lord, because of thy speech. And oftentimes, I'll go back to this, we'll hear something and we'll allow it to be like water off a duck's back. It just rolls right off and never gets down to the duck. It never uh, makes its way down to its body. It just rolls off because of how it just sheds right off its feathers. And so somebody may hear something from the Bible and they may sit there and they may think, you know, this man's preaching. I hear everything he's saying. And, uh, but you know something? I don't really care what he says. That, uh, that, just, that, that don't sit well with me. It doesn't matter how it sits with you if it's the Bible. And what God is doing is God is calling you to either receive it or reject it. And if you reject it, it's not God's fault. But if you receive it and you move forward with God on that, you'll see that you'll be much better off in walking with God. Habakkuk said, God, I've heard. Habakkuk could have said, no, Lord, no. This ain't going to be good. Let's not do that. Don't send the Babylonians. Send, send Egypt. Well, Egypt's going to get destroyed by Babylon, so that'd be good for him to say, send them because there won't be nobody to send. Or he could have said, you know, Lord, I just don't think you ought to use them. I think, but Habakkuk says, no, I've heard you, Lord. And I was afraid. It's, it's caused me to be afraid. It's caused, but, but no, remember now, he's singing. This is coming out of him like a, a song of praise unto God. What he's heard God say. How God has given him and said to him something. So we find it, it's causing him to do something. But then I want you, I, thirdly, I want to point out to you this. We're underneath the speech involved, and we'll be through in a few moments. We find the request of the Savior. Look what the Bible says now. In verse number two, we see that word, O oh Lord, again. He repeats himself, oh Lord. And he says, oh Lord. But notice what he says. Revive. He says, revive. Now, just when you hear the word revive alone, you think to, to rekindle or make alive again. Bring back. If somebody is at the point of death and they're revived, they're brought back. I think it was Vance Hadley that said, most people don't need revival, most people need revival. Mm -hmm. They've never been made alive. They're still dead. They need to be made alive to begin with. But the fact is, where Habakkuk is, Habakkuk already knows this is in process. It's going on. But Habakkuk also knows who he's talking to and the love that who he's talking to has for his people. Habakkuk knows, God, you love your people. Habakkuk knows, God, I'm one of your people. I'm called by thy name, Lord. You've called me out. You've chosen me, Lord. I've not chosen you, but you've chosen me. The Lord said, have not I chosen you? And so at the end of the day, Habakkuk is crying out to God. His heart is crying out to God. Revive. But notice this. Notice the part they say to revive. He said, revive thy work. He didn't say, God, revive my work. He didn't say, Habakkuk's eyes is not only on him. Habakkuk is thinking about all that I've done or all that I've seen or all that I've been a part of. He says, no, it's much greater than that. It's much larger than that. It's not about just me. God, it's a thy work. And God, we're thy people. And we're called by thy name. And so he says, revive thy work. When? Now, in your Bible, you'll find these three words a whole lot. In the midst. In the, or four words, in the midst of. You'll find that quite often in your Bible in different areas. But there's only one place. You find it in the years. In the midst of the years. And that's here. And when you come to this place and you find revive thy work in the midst of the years, 
You think that Habakkuk understands that he knows that it's in the middle of it. He knows that they're right smack dab in the middle of what God has already given and what God has said. But Habakkuk knows if there's any hope at all um, for God's people, it's going to be that he revives them or ruins on the way. And we all know as we've read our Bible and come through that Israel goes into ruin, that Israel is scattered out amongst the people, that Israel is taken in captivity by Babylon. But it says, oh Lord, while I'm here, would you revive thy work? in the midst of the years. Can I say this tonight, church? One thing about it. America may be headed downhill and downhill fast, but as long as I'm here, I would that God would revive his work in the midst of the years. As long as I'm here, God, would you a little longer revive thy work? A little farther cause us to keep pressing forward for Jesus. A little more. Revive us, O Lord. We need thee. Habakkuk said, revive thy work in the midst of the years, but notice this, in the midst of the years make known. He said, God, as surely as you have told me everything that would come to pass, I'm asking you to make it known unto your people as well. And you know, God told Habakkuk, God, God said to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, write this, that when they read it, they'll know it. And he that runs when he read it, He'll still not. And so it says, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the years, in the midst of the years, make known. Now think about this. I wrote this down because, uh, and, it's, and it's interesting to me, roughly 24 to 2,500 years before Habakkuk, Enoch was translated so he would not see death. And Noah was born. Roughly 24 to 2,500 years before this that we're reading. Enoch was translated, Noah was born. And we know what happens when Methuselah dies. And we know what takes place. And we know how God keeps his people and how God carries them through the flood. And how God brings them out on the other side. And we know kind of how that types some different things in the word of God. And we thank the Lord for that. But hold on a minute because I'd say this. And from the fact of where Habakkuk is to where we are... It is said roughly to be 2,500 to 2,600 years. And so as we read Habakkuk, we can literally say in the midst of the years, because in the midst of from between Enoch to Habakkuk and from Habakkuk to us is roughly the same amount of time. And some of this that Habakkuk is given, I know this may just blow people's minds, and that's fine because mine's there too. So you, I want yours to be there with mine. In the middle of all of this, Habakkuk sees something that's futuristic. Not just for them concerning Babylon coming in, but for his people later on, as in when God comes again, and when God comes back and establishes his kingdom, and when God turns things back over, and when God makes a new thing that he's going to make a new, and when God sets up shop, as we call it, Habakkuk can see that. And he says, in the midst of the years, Lord, in the midst of the things that look like it's going to ruin, would you revive thy word? And can I say this? If Habakkuk was looking forward to that day, how much closer are we today? How much more? When we think of the return of Christ to be imminent, we believe that, don't we? Yeah. Amen. When you think about that, how much closer could it be? But notice this. When we think about the request of the Savior... I'd like for you to look over in your Bibles. We'll be through in just a few moments in Psalm 85. Psalm 85. We're talking about a heart cry. We're talking about a heart cry. And in Psalm chapter number 85, we have the heading of this psalm to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. Y'all remember who the sons of Korah are, right? They're the ones that had to decide to stay with Moses and to go with God rather than to go with their daddy. And so they, they chose to stand with God and watch their daddy get swallowed up and go down into the pit. That's pretty serious business. And we think about the sons of Korah. We read different psalms in the Word of God that have their names attached to it. And this is one of them. The Bible says in verse number 4, it says, Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry, in verse number 5, wilt thou be angry with us? 
forever. Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Here it is. Here's another heart cry and request of the Savior. Wilt thou not revive us again that notice this, thy people. He didn't say, they didn't say, wilt thou not revive us again so that my people. He said, no, that thy people, what? May rejoice, but hold on. What are they going to rejoice in? He said they may rejoice in thee. Not even rejoice in the revival, but rejoice in the God of it. The only way anybody's ever going to have revival is if we start looking to God instead of looking to everything else and get over ourselves. I'm sick and tired of people thinking, well, I've got a problem with so-and-so. Well, as long as you've got one with so-and-so, you'll never be right with God. Well, I've got an issue here. Well, as long as you've got an issue there, and if it has anything to do with God's Word, you'll never be right with God. What you need to do is come clean, get thoroughly right and cleansed with God, and thank God for what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says. But notice this. In Isaiah chapter number 64, if you'll look over there in Isaiah chapter 64, now you sang it tonight. I know I may have called it to be sung, but you sang it. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what? You sing, revive us again at the last part of that chorus. Now is that just something you just wanted to roll off your lips and not mean anything? Because I can promise you in Habakkuk chapter number 3, this isn't just rolling off Habakkuk's lips and not meaning anything. This song is his heart in Habakkuk chapter 3. Notice Isaiah chapter number 64. The Bible says in verse number 1, I want you to know what real revival looks like. As a matter of fact, I'll go back to chapter number 63, verse number 17. O oh Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and hardened our hearts from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake the tribes of thine inheritance. The people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. Now, hold on a minute. Because what Habakkuk is crying out to God, his heart that's crying out to God about, is what Isaiah has seen. He said, they've trodden down thy sanctuaries. Notice this. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. Isaiah said, they have never been called by your name, but we have, O Lord. And then 64.1 comes. Here's, on, here's another heart cry. Here's another heart cry. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. Well, you hear people say it all the time. Rend the heavens, O Lord. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. That thou wouldest come down. What we need is the God of glory to come down and come down and meet with his people in this day, in this age. It shouldn't be something far-fetched. It shouldn't be something that's only happened in days gone by. But we should desire God meet with us tonight. Amen. Notice this. That the mountains might flow down at thy presence. You see, when the presence of God is known, things begin to change. Things are altered. They can't stay the same. And when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. <laughs> Go back over, please, to Habakkuk chapter 3. We'll be through. Habakkuk's singing this song and we're going to look back at this song the Lord willing next time we're in Habakkuk chapter 3 because he he recalls to remember some things in this song as he's singing unto the Lord but the last part of verse number 2 the Bible says in wrath remember mercy now, he's singing unto the Lord. He did not say, O oh Lord, take the wrath away. That's not what he said. 
He didn't say, Lord, would you please turn that wrath and don't just don't let it come this way. Why? Because God is a just God. And the judgment is deserved. Because if you remember correctly, in Habakkuk chapter 1, he says, God, your people are terrible. And he responds with, I'm going I'm to fix what's taking place, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk doesn't say, God, would you, would you mind just turning that? And let's just turn from channel 3 to channel 4 and see if we can't get better reception with something else. That's not what Habakkuk says. But Habakkuk, Habakkuk knows in his soul that as just as God is, he's a merciful God. He's a merciful God. Now let me recall to your remembrance something tonight. There was one that was on the auction block of sin. You can write your name there. It was you. And God is a just God. And there's a payment and a price for your sin. And that is death. That is Bible, amen. That's what the Bible says. For the soul that sinneth shall surely die. Surely die. There's no getting around that. The life of the flesh is in the blood. It's in the blood. God's a just God. Praise God, He's a merciful God. Because instead of His judgment being laid on us, He laid it on Himself through His Son. And He took upon that which we could not take. And He died in your place. And you understand what mercy is because of what Christ has done. Now, I said this at the beginning. There's three options. I'm finishing it with the same statement that one of the ones I started with in my introduction. One man said it like this. There's three options. There's ruin. Let me ask you something. Did Israel see a real turning revival? I'm not talking about a temporary one. Because underneath Josiah, they seen one. Now, whether or not Habakkuk was in the midst of Josiah's reign and he seen what was going on, but God had already told him what was going to take place, so he knew that wasn't where he was. He called on God's mercy. So it's either ruin. What happened to Israel? They ruined. Israel found themselves in ruin. It's revival. Revival. Or it's rapture. Church, rapture is on its way. Amen. Rapture is on its way. I praise the Lord for that. But why can't revival be? Why can't revival be? Let me say this. This needs to be personal for you right now. In your own life, saved by God's grace, born again, you're either headed toward ruin, you're headed for revival, rapture is going to take place. But before rapture takes place, why don't we catch that second one and experience revival? Is that what you want? Do you really want revival? You say, you just, you, you, you look how America really is. I believe the Lord has, has used America in a mighty way. In a mighty way. And it, look, it looks like by all natural eye looking in, thinking from a spiritual standpoint, she's, she's destined for destruction. We can have revival. But the only way is if personally we have it first. 
personally, we have it first. A heart cry is what we see. Father, I love you this evening. I have given what thou hast given me. And I ask you, please, work. Work, oh God. Please work. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it is me. Work in me. Forgive thou mine iniquities. Cleanse thou me, O Lord. Revive me, O God. O Lord, send a revival. Revive us again. Revive me. In the midst of the years, revive me. Lord, I can't make anybody else go with me. But I desire to go with thee. I want it to be that I'll go with thee to the ends of the earth because I know that you will go with me to the end of the world. You said it in your word. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. Father, in thy wrath, remember mercy. Whatever America may see, whatever America may go through, whatever we may experience, I'm calling on a merciful God, as David knew when he had to accept a punishment for a penalty of sin that he made, because he knew you were a merciful God calling on a merciful God. I know we don't deserve it, for it would not be mercy if we did. I thank you and I praise you for all that you do. It's in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen.